Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. This is Eileen Manster from LCI, and I'll be your uh, moderator for today's webinar. First of all, we'd like to thank L uh, XL Construction for being our presenters today. And I do have a, a couple of housekeeping items for you. The first one is you'll notice the red arrow on the box at the right-hand side of your screen. This is to minimize and maximize the screen for better viewing of the presentation. You'll also notice the questions box. This will be to type in all of the questions that you have and there will be a small plus delta at the end of the presentation. Pluses are things that you really enjoyed about the presentation and deltas are things that you wish we would have done more of or that you wish we would have not done at all. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the presentation is being recorded and the presentation, the um, audio, and the slide deck will be available on our website within the, by the end of next week. So again, the presentation is being recorded, and you will be able to view it on our website by the end of next week. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the guys from Excel Construction. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, thank you, everybody out there who's joining our webinar on using leading indicators to improve construction safety. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the uh, agenda here. So we'll start with some personal introductions, um, and I'm going to jump to that right now. Uh, I'm Jason Fox, Project Executive with XL Construction. Uh, my name is Mike Pop. I'm the Vice President of Safety here at XL. My name is Kevin Ng, also Project Executive. And I'll be talking a little bit about XL Construction. Uh, there's a lot of people on this webinar that aren't uh, necessarily from the Bay Area. so that would be helpful for you guys to understand who we are. Um, also be walking you through kind of the lean journey that we've been going through um, over the last several years. Uh, we'll be talking about industry safety metrics and then Kevin's going to be jumping into really the nuts and bolts of this uh, webinar talking about the concepts of tracking, methods for tracking, and how we use that information and really where we see this going forward. And then we'll open up to Q&A. And at the end, we'll have our uh, contact information up if you guys have any questions uh, that you want to reach out to us about after the webinar. All right, so first and foremost, just a little bit about XL Construction. Uh, we are a mid-sized contractor in the Bay Area. Uh, we have three offices, uh, one in Silicon Valley, one in Sacramento, and one in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, we really consider ourselves a... Um, a contractor that uh, gravitates towards complicated technical projects. You can see the market segments there that we uh, that we work in typically. Um, so healthcare, uh, science and technology, things that uh, we would consider are uh, highly technical projects. We also perform a large amount of our own work, so we do a lot of self-perform work. Um, and you can see a list of those those uh, activities there. And I, I point this out because. Uh, you contractors and subcontractors are on phone probably already know this, but the more self-performed work a general does, obviously the higher risk of a safety incident that could happen on your job. Um, so I just point that out so to put this uh, to put this in context as we move forward, you can understand and appreciate our achievements with our safety record. Um, we're going to be talking a lot today, or referring back to the, our EMR rate, and so we're going to spend just a minute here. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with EMR is and explain how that works. Yes, yeah, so as Jason mentioned, just a sort of a brief overview of what an experience modification rate is and how it's used. Uh, essentially, an EMR rate is used by insurance companies to really compare, for example, XL against other like-size general contractors uh, to really help assess the amount of money that they will be charging us for our workers' compensation premiums. Um, the way this works is that the carriers report our company's class code um, and payroll as well as losses for the previous five years to a workers' compensation rating bureau. Uh, that bureau then reviews the data to determine the EMR of our company. So, for example, if you were at an industry average for construction, uh, based on your loss history, your EMR would be a 1.0. Uh, if your experience was 20% better than the average, your experience modifier would be 0.80, and if you were 20% worse, it would be a 1.20. Um, and really, I think the biggest reason that these rates are important is that we have found that more recently our sophisticated clients are really looking at these numbers to 
determine um, who to award contracts to um, at bid time. So they can have a real positive impact on your company or they can have a negative impact depending on, on where you fall in the pack. All right, so next I'm just going to touch on kind of our lean journey over the last several years. Uh, so prior to, I'll say, 2008, um, from the time of inception, we, we really approach safety like most other general contractors in the industry, which I'll call the traditional approach to safety, which really focused on motivating workers to be safe and providing safety training that may or may not address the root cause of safety incidents on your job. Now this was and is an effective approach to safety. Um, as you can see from the list of our EMR numbers on the right there, uh, we were maintaining a below average EMR, but uh, in the spirit of lean, uh, we were always looking to um, improve that number. Um, so, so in 2009, that was really a pivotal year for XL construction. We were awarded a project with Johnson & Johnson, uh, who was a uh, who's an advocate of lean principles. And this was really our first project ever where we uh, incorporated lean principles into our construction process. Uh, and since then, we've been going down the journey of, of implementing lean on uh, most of our projects. Uh, what came out of this project um, is the idea of leading indicators and using those uh, to manage safety on our project. And so you might ask, what is a leading indicator? So Johnson & Johnson, during this project, they had already had a definition of uh, leading indicators. Not sure if they created this definition or if this is something prior that was developed, but the definition used was, it's a preventive or proactive measure that is taken in order to decrease the possibility of an incident. So this idea, what it brings into play is the possibility of actually predicting a safety incident before it ever happens by measuring, measuring and analyzing safety infractions. It's a very proactive approach versus uh, historically has been um, you know, somewhat of a reactive approach to safety in the industry. Um, this approach, utilizing leading indicators, um, along with our strong safety culture that we have here at XL Construction, we've been able to achieve a 0.35 EMR. Uh, which currently is the lowest in California. Um, and then there's some other safety statistics here that we'd like to share with you, which is we have had zero lost work days in seven years running, uh, 5.2 million man hours with no lost time injuries, and our safety program uh, has been consistently recognized um, for the work that we've done and the uh, achievements we've accomplished. So knowing all that, we might ask ourselves, why do we drive to have these numbers? Why do we drive to have the lowest EMR in California? Mike's going to jump into kind of explaining the industry safety metrics um, and and uh, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so as Jason mentioned, you know, you, you ask yourself, why is safety important? And I think that there are, I think there's probably many, many answers that could be given to that. But today I'm going to focus on two of the top reasons that I believe safety is important and that we here at Excel really focus on it. You know, simply put, I think safety is important, um, and we believe safety is important because it's about people. And so for us, it's really the most important thing that we do every day. Um, while we are a general contractor, and of course we are hired to build buildings, I think that all of us share the same, same thought that our real job is to make sure that we send all of our workers home every day without any injuries to their loved ones. Because for us, honestly, if we can't achieve that, then any other measure of a success doesn't really matter a whole lot, you know? Um, I think the secondary reason, and that's I think more of what you guys want to hear about today, is that it really makes good business sense um, because the reality is there are costs associated with um, performance of safety, and so those can either have a good impact or a not so good impact. And I think I'm going to focus on a few key areas today, uh, direct costs and indirect costs, um, but I wanted to highlight uh, emotional costs because sometimes I think that that gets overlooked, and so if you think about you know the grief and anguish uh, that impacts a family, uh, particularly in the case of a fatality or a very severe injury, um, it really affects everybody. Um, it, it can totally change somebody's entire lifestyle. Um, it can impact the spouse, children, parents, um, their friends, the community, uh, the company um, that sustained the injury. And so I think uh, em emotional costs are the ones that really drive us more than anything uh, to try to avoid injuries at all costs. Um, and then we get into more of direct costs. Uh, direct costs are really tangible and can be easily measured in terms of dollars. 
um, they're more easy to quantify. Um, a few examples of direct costs would be the cost of replacing labor and training. Uh, it can be repairing machinery or replacing machinery that was broken. Um, the cost of emergency services, uh, the increase in insurance premiums, um, a negative impact on EMR, and of course possible OSHA citations or fines which can be very significant. Uh, some examples of indirect costs which are intangible costs and not uh, so easily visible or uh, easy to quantify. Um, and I would say, you know, again, it kind of goes back to the emotional costs. Uh, so, for example, the family stress and pressure, loss of community, loss of job opportunities, uh, permanent changes in somebody's lifestyle due to physical dis uh, disabilities they sustained, and those are all things that we strive to avoid at all costs. So, how do we, as Mike mentioned and Jason mentioned, um, uh, how I think what what we find strongly in the in the industry among our clients, competitors, subcontractors, and the overall general construction community is that uh, there is a very strong focus on measuring lagging indicators of safety performance. Um, specifically, what Mike was talking about, EMR, recordable incident rate. Those types of measures are all very prevalent across the industry and do a good job of measuring overall um, safety performance of different firms. What we found uh, throughout our process was that um, in the absence of a lot of incidents or accidents, uh, which most uh, good contractors avoid uh, for the most part, there really is not a, um, a really good way to measure how well you're doing uh, in between those times when incidents occur. So if incidents or accidents are every seven or ten years uh, for a lot of firms, how are you measuring performance of safety in between those, in between those uh, infrequent incidents? That's, that's uh, goal number one of what we're trying to look at um, in more detail. Goal number two is to really take an in-depth look at what can we do to measure our performance in preventing those incidents? So um, we look at um, a, a number of different aspects of that that I'm going to talk about today, but really it comes down to looking at, um, like I said, in the absence of lagging indicator data, which there's not a lot of, um, being able to look at leading indicators to measure, essentially, are we getting lucky by not having any incidents, or are we... Uh, um, uh, taking steps to proactively prevent accidents and incidents from occurring. So what you're looking at on the, on the screen now is just like almost all contractors that we compete with, owners that we perform work for, and subcontractors that we hire, we have a fairly robust safety program. Um, not, not fairly robust, an extensively robust safety program that covers all aspects of construction um, it's then supplemented on each project by a site-specific plan that's tailored specifically for each project. What those essentially do, as you guys are all probably uh, aware of, essentially sets ground rules um, and outlines criteria for safety performance on a job site. Um, Cal OSHA sets out um, requirements for inspections and sets out requirements for reporting. Um, but what, what, we're t what, uh, the, what we've identified as a preventative measure program is to really take an in-depth look at measuring our performance or our, or our project's performance against all of those rules and regulations and our site-specific safety program. So a long way to get to what you're looking at on the screen is essentially an outline of our, um, our safety inspections that we, that we perform uh, or we perform um, kind of in a standard way, uh, and we've taken those, those um, the organization of those inspections and tr really tried to dive deeper into measuring how well are we complying on an everyday and an hour-by-hour -hour basis with each of the criteria that are set out um, in, in uh, our various overall safety programs. So what we do essentially, um, what the screen you're looking at there now is, what we do is we, we keep track of every observation or inspection on every project uh, where an instance is observed of anything not being in compliance with any aspect of our safety program. 
So from th simple things like not wearing safety glasses or not wearing a safety vest to um, more severe things like having a tool that's um, uh, not properly not properly maintained or a ladder that's not that's uh, uh, dangerously damaged or something like that to even the more the most severe uh, things like not complying with fall protection measures on the job or open trenches that are not properly uh, barricaded, et cetera. So on each project, we track um, down to the minute detail each instance of every observation that's uh, on that job of noncompliance with our safety program. We categorize it. Um, based on that previous slide, we categorize it in a number of different ways and we'll look at how we organize that data and how we report it. But uh, one important thing to note is that we Although we do keep track of what um, firm the uh, or what subcontractor or owner or um, general contractor firm is responsible for the the observation that's being made, we don't keep track of uh, except in extreme cases. We don't keep track of which person um, on the job site was was specifically observed not in compliance, and we do that for a couple reasons that I'll talk about going forward, but. Um, most importantly, it's to really maintain a sense of um, uh, a positive sense about the program as opposed to a kind of a punitive sense about it and making sure that that translates into making sure we capture robust data and the data doesn't get um, polluted or limited by people being hesitant to report uh, observations that they made in the field. So essentially what, what, the, what the screen is that you're looking at now is a, a, li, a, su a subset of the listing from one project of each of those observations. We then take, um, take that data and categorize it uh, and, and kind of um, uh, pour through it and tweak it and look at it in a number of different ways. And I'll walk through a couple of those. Uh, and then we'll, look, then we'll talk about kind of how we use the data and how we use the different outputs of that information uh, on our job site. So the first way we look at it is, is pretty simplistically. It's just an overall categorization of every observation that we've made in the field. Uh, the the uh, key that you're looking at on the right, or the legend on the right, is really uh, the, it's the table of contents from our safety program. So we break each observation into the different categories of our safety program and simply track um, how often and the quantity of observations of noncompliance in each of those categories. So what this gives us is, is a really good high-level way of looking at overall in the job site what are the areas of focus, um, uh, what are the areas of focus for, or for uh, um, training and enforcement of our safety program on a day-to-day -day basis and what, um, you know, what um, high risk areas might exist on the job site that might need to be addressed. For example, the 45 that you're looking at on the, on the left, the biggest portion of, of the pie chart there is probably PPE, which we would expect to be a, a pretty high percentage. Um, but there's some other, other sections of that pie that if we see the numbers getting higher than we've seen in the past or higher than we would expect on a particular job, we would be more alarmed and more um, more able to react to specifically address that, like fall protection or scaffolds. Um, if we see large numbers of observations of unsafe um, behavior in those categories, uh, we use this chart to say, okay, we've had more observations in those areas than we would have expected and something significant needs to be done to address that. So similar to that pie chart, what you're looking at here is just that pie chart essentially converted into a stacked bar graph, but broken up by firm uh, on the job site. Like I said in the beginning, we, do, we, we keep track of which firm uh, each observation is attributable to. Uh, and then we, we provide uh, overall categorized observations by firm to each of the trades that are on the job, including uh, ourselves, the owner, and any owner subcontractors or consultants that come onto the job. So a couple things that this helps with um, in the way that it's used on the job. Number one, it, it gives kind of an overall measure of um, 
kind of a gut level reaction of how many observations for each firm um, are being reported, which is somewhat important, but we'll talk in a minute about how it's important to look at that information in context. It also gives um, each, of the, each of the trade crews on the job site, it gives them a subset of the overall data broken up by category so that they can look for, um, similar to what we looked at for overall on the job site, they can look for trends within their own uh, execution of work and their own behavior to, that they may specifically need to address. So if that makes sense, each, each uh, trade or group on the job is essentially getting their own uh, pie chart of data to be able to look at uh, how they may need to adjust their specific, their trade specific safety programs on the job. Uh, I talked a little bit before about making sure we look at overall corrections in context. So this, this graph that we're looking at on the screen now reflects that. Um, essentially what we've done here is create uh, an, a recordable incident rate uh, for the job site, for each trade on our job site, but based not on incidents, instead basing that on the um, frequency of unsafe observations uh, for each firm on the job site. And we create that rate based on man hours worked on the job site to date. That's, that's uh, almost exactly how, Cal, how OSHA creates the, the EMR rate, or recordable incident rate, is based on number of incidents times the man hours divided by uh, a constant to equal the rate. We've done taken a similar calculation here and said the number of observations per for that specific for each specific firm on the job site multiplied by the number of man hours that they've worked on the job to date divided by a constant gives us um, a comparable rate for each uh, for each subcontractor or trade partner on the job essentially. So what that does is it gives us a, uh, a kind of an in context measurement of how often um, observations are made for each of these firms on the job site and gives us a better sense of kind of real performance or real compliance with the safety program uh, for each firm. So even if, if we go back a couple slides, you don't have to go back, but if you remember that those stacked bar charts that we were looking at before, a number of those firms uh, had pretty high, uh, high uh, column bar, stack bars, meaning they had a, a lot of corrections on the job site, but when you put that in context of how many people they had working every day on the job, the rate actually for those firms might be lower than somebody who had an, a lower overall number of corrections. And so that's why this is important is uh, to make sure that we're paying attention not only to the firms that have a lot of people on the job site, but also that we're paying attention to uh, firms that maybe don't either don't have a lot of people or are working for shorter amounts of time on each project and making sure that we're uh, addressing trends in their behavior as well on the job. Okay, uh, another kind of quick way, and I'll go through this a little bit quickly because it's a little bit confusing, but another way we, we found beneficial to look at the data that comes out of the observations is to look at it over time. So this is a snapshot of a wider graph. Uh, the vertical colors that you see in the background of this represent uh, phases of the job. Uh, and the x-axis is just weeks, weeks over time of the job, and the different uh, colored lines represent the um, unsafe observations for each category uh, that you see on the right in the, in the legend there. So over time and viewed in the, in the context of the phase of the job, we really start to look for trends, um, trends over time that might need to be corrected or adjusted or could even just better inform uh, how, we, how we are executing work on the project. So um, this is, it, it does get a little bit confusing but, or a little bit uh, busy on the graph, but what we look for are large spikes or large uh, trend swings in a particular category um, for two reasons. Number one, we can address if a concern or a uh, behavior is changing that's creating a hazard, if there's uh, correction categories that are trending upwards, we look for ways to correct that. But then we can also measure uh, the effectiveness of our training programs or things that we've done to correct or to adjust behavior on the job site. We can measure are those corrections, those observations trending downward after we've implemented that, um, 
the corrective measure and really take a look at uh, was our was our implementation effective and was behavior actually ch actually changed to make the job site safer uh, by what we've done or, or how we've chosen to adjust the safety program on the job. If we look at that in a, little, a, a much more simplistic way, uh, that's what this graph is, is looking at overall correction quantity on the job uh, in the same way over time and by phase of the job. Just a single line in green there representing the total quantity of, obs of unsafe observations by week and then a yellow, yellow is really the, the trend line um, or, or moving average line actually of the, of the overall quantity. A couple of things on this, we, we, we do um, like to see this number, this quantity trending downward, especially after we've made adjustments in our safety program to try and uh, correct behavior on the job site or correct, correct an unsafe observation on the job. But we also don't want to see this number trend downward uh, too much or too far to zero because we, we use this to look at are we doing accurate or accurate uh, assessment of the job and capturing, um, you know, capturing observations at an adequate rate uh, as opposed to, you know, if, if we don't do enough observations or we're not collecting adequate data, um, that would lead to this, this number trending downward um, but for the wrong reasons because we're not doing the observations adequately. So a couple ways to look at that. So that, that's kind of how we collect, or the data that we collect, how we kind of categorize it. We do, we, you know, there's lots of different, lots of different ways to look at the data once it's collected, and those are just a few examples that we've found specifically helpful. Um, but how do we use the information specifically on the on projects uh, to make a difference in how safe the job site is, or how well we can prevent um, incidents from occurring? A couple of different ways. Uh, we on the left there you can see visual aids. We actually do um, print out those graphs among other um, ways to report the data. We print them out and distribute them to everybody on the job site and also post them on the job site. And that um, does a couple of things. It, it makes sure that people are looking at the data, number one. It also gives kind of, I mean, construction people tend to be, tend to be visual thinkers. Um, and so it gives them a visual on the job site every day of how safety is being measured and also of overall performance. Um, and, and we found that that really helps uh, create a culture of safety on the job, provide, uh, you know, bring safety to the, to the forefront of people's minds as they work on the job, in addition to the other, you know, pre-task meetings and job hazard analysis and type of things that we do. It really provides another more visual way of uh, presenting safety information to specifically to the field crews in the job, the people that are executing work on a project. Uh, the middle graphic there, we do we do try to create some type of incentive programs around um, not only the results of the data that we collect, but also uh, sometimes we tie incentive to the actual collection of the data um, to try and again make sure that we have uh, that we collect actual data. But it because it's um, you know, these are daily measured um, matrices of, of information. It's easy to tie incentives to really whatever behavior we're trying to, um, we're trying to uh, uh, help uh, influence. So like I said, if it's performance or if it's something like PPE and we tie incentive to a reduction in PPE um, corrections or even, like I said, tying it to the collection of the data. If we are able to capture X amount of data points a week or a month, sometimes we tie job site incentive uh, to that. And that can be in the form of, you know, things like bar safety barbecues or safety raffles or, um, you know, safety shirt giveaways or, or things like that on the job site, things that um, are fairly typical, but then we're tying that, again, to, to a slightly different um, uh, me method of measuring, whereas traditionally I think that's usually tied to man hours work without an incident or man hours work without a, uh, a lost time incident or a recordable incident, which is, I, I mean, I think that's good. I just think if, if you're able to, uh, most of our projects go through the, the entirety of the project without a lost time injury or without a recordable incident. And so um, this 
what we found is that this helps us just dive a little bit deeper and look at um, a measurement of the more preventative measures of those lagging indicators as opposed to um, you know what, what I would consider kind of catastrophic events like a like a lost time injury or a uh, or a quotable incident. Um, and then on the right, the last the last and probably maybe even the most important way that we use it is that we have um, we have uh, specific trainings or adjustments to our safety safety programs on the job site that are um, created in response to observations. Uh, from the leading indicator data that we collected. So if we're, if we're on a, you know, we're required to do trainings on the job site by OSHA and sometimes in the past we just kind of pick an arbitrary topic like ladder safety or scissor lift use or something like that out of the blue and the training is less relevant than maybe it needs, it should be. If we, when we look at the specific observed data from a job site and the specific areas of behavior that um, have been observed and measured and need to be uh, corrected. If we're able to tailor job site specific training to adjusting that specific behavior, we found that that has a more direct impact uh, on the prevention of accidents on our job sites. Um, this, this again, just more ways that we use the information. Um, on the left, we talk about target uh, target specific project trainings. Which is what I was just talking about. The middle bullet's also important there, firm-specific targeted training. If you remember from one of those initial ways that we look at information, we give each firm or each crew their subset of data broken out by category. Um, and it, in addition to tailoring project-specific trainings to a specific behavior, it really lets each firm uh, target their specific safety program to observe behavior as well. So. What that's helpful in is that overall for the job site, the, the, the overall job site behavior might not necessarily specifically match uh, the hazards that exist for a specific firm or a specific trade or a specific crew on the job. And providing the information to each crew or each trade for them to be able to analyze and provide specific training to their, um, to their activities we really found that that gets into another level of targeted um, prevention on the job as well. And then on the right, we, we do, we use uh, both the data collect manually and some end data that we input into uh, a software program to perform a level of uh, predictive analytics on the job. And that helps in addition to kind of the, um, the, uh, observation of the data, it really, predictive, predictive analytics allows us to draw on not only our past um, data collection and performance measurement, but also industry trends, industry observations, um, and industry analytics overall for the construction industry to be able to analyze the data that we're collecting and provide more, um, I don't want to say more, more role robust predictions for, for when we, a job might be at risk for an incident or might be at risk for an accident, as well as uh, to give us a sense of what changes in data or trends in data um, might, be, uh, might, re might be alarming or require action based on not only our information but on industry information as well. So we use not only our own resources but also third-party software to help with uh, specifically predictive analytics. Um, on each of our jobs. So we've been doing this for several years. Um, like Jason mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it's a continual process that um, can be challenging, frankly. So moving forward, we, we do have specific challenges that I notice on in implementation of this for Excel, but also um, kind of in the industry that we notice that um, I would like to see addressed not only by us, but also by the community. And what I, I, when I step, step back and thought about it, the kind of three or two uh, major things that I see as a challenge to this type of program, um, number one in the middle there, data collection is, um, I would say, by far the number one challenge of this type of, this type of measurement. It requires not only, um, you know, safety professionals and supervision professionals like superintendents on the project 
doing observations and tracking uh, more information than they're used to. But in order for the data set to truly be robust and to be um, the most relevant that it can be, it requires, uh, there's a direct correlation between that and the number of observations that are done on the job. So the challenge on each project is to capture as much information as possible uh, on, on every project. And so we found that trying to find ways for not only safety professionals, management and supervision from the general contractor on the job to provide data, also trying to get uh, owners to participate, uh, design professionals to participate, as well as uh, trade partners and, um, and actual tradesmen in the field to provide their observations as well and their data points into the into the data set uh, has been a challenge because it's it takes um, it takes training and it takes uh, reiteration on every job to try and develop habits for um, providing that information and lastly on the right you know it's kind of a related challenge is to try and get uh, not only data uh, input but also for people to view the data output as um, as collaborative as opposed to punitive. Uh, a lot of times safety, frankly, historically anyway, has been viewed as um, kind of a punitive approach on job sites. There's the safety police and there's punishments for bad behavior, et cetera. And really what I've found the most benefit from is a shift from that to a culture where, yes, there's consequences for, um, for not compliance, but there's also um, value overall to creating a culture where providing input into a safety program to make, uh, to establish the basis for making the overall program better can be mutually beneficial to everybody on the job site and creating a collaborative approach not only for data collection but also for uh, analyzing data, changing behaviors, and uh, using information to make the job site safer. It's, it's a challenge to create that uh, to shift from kind of a punitive view of safety to a collaborative view. Um, so more challenges moving forward or, or issues that we're trying to address moving forward. Automated data collection on the left and integration with existing safety software. There's a number of different safety softwares uh, on the market. We've found that um, we found it challenging to come up with the perfect way to do automated data collection to make it as easy as possible for everybody on the job to collect data and provide input. Um, and so we work through that. But also integrating different methods of collecting data into, into uh, software programs we found to be a challenge. It's, it's um, a lot easier for um, us to ask a project manager or a project engineer or uh, a design professional or an owner to use an iPad to collect data, for example, um, or an, an, you know, an iPhone or a computer to collect data. We really want to make sure we capture data from folks that aren't using those types of devices on a daily basis. And so making that process um, streamlined and automated uh, has been a challenge across those different uh, levels of, um, of use of electronics and automation on the project. Uh, the, the middle graphic there, increasing historical data set for improved predictive analytics. That's a, it is not so much a challenge, but um, it's a, a task moving forward is to make sure that we're capturing data, we're relying on the industry to capture data, and using, making sure that we incorporate industry-wide as well as company-wide um, data sets for use in predictive analytics um, is something that I think can really uh, make the process much more beneficial on a day-to-day -day basis because it provides um, obviously just more information and more uh, contextual views of behavior uh, to be able to, to analyze and provide uh, predictions for job sites. So the last bullet on the right, I think what I would ask for the community is uh, just to, to get a sense of what are you guys doing on your jobs, what have you seen, have you seen similar similar processes uh, implemented in other places? Have you faced similar challenges? How do you see, um, number one, could you see this benefiting a project that you guys are working on? But also, if you have experienced similar type of um, challenges uh, with safety on projects that you've been involved in, how do you, 
how do you uh, address some of the challenges, or what might some of the challenges be that you guys feel are maybe even more pertinent to the process than what I've brought up today? Uh, I am really interested in, in opening that discussion uh, with the community at large. So with that, I think that, that's the end of our presentation. Um, so I think, Eileen, we're just going to open it up for, for questions uh, or comments, if there are any. Uh, actually, there are. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting your contact information back on the screen, there were some questions. If you have questions about specific software or specific coaching methods, please contact the presenters directly, and they'll be able to answer those questions for you. Again, I did want to let you know that this presentation is being recorded, and the recording and slide deck will be available on the LCI website in the safety section, which you can get to from our homepage by the end of next week. So let's start here with the questions. The first one is, is your company a GC only and or self-performed? Uh, we're, we're both. So we're a general contractor. And like Jason mentioned, we, we do a large amount of self-performed work. Um, the, the information that we're looking at involves our self-perform of concrete, carpentry, uh, and uh, demolition and laborer type activities. So we're, we self-perform those three trades. Um, laborers, carpenters, and cement masons are our unions that we're signatory to. So we self-perform trades associated with those three. And I think it's also uh, somewhat relevant to point out that our, that our concrete division not only self-perform work for us, XL Construction, but they also act as a subcontractor to other general contractors. So um, they kind of wear both hats. But at the end of the day, they, they are XL construction, and their man hours that they put in place in the field um, reflect back to XL construction. OK, our second question is, how do you collect man hours for each subcontractor by each project? Uh, well, we do that. I mean, we do that regardless of the safety program. We track that in our, in our daily reports on each project. So, it's, it's at a project level that we collect that information, um, and the, you know, the uh, superintendent, project manager, foreman on each job are, are tasked daily with just keeping track of how many people from each firm are on each, are on each project, and then that information is captured uh, in our daily reports. I'd like to remind everybody that we're also going to do a quick plus delta. So if you have any pluses or delta, please go ahead and mark those in the questions box as well. We want to make sure that all of our educational offerings are the best that they can be for you. So we'd love to hear from you. So please go ahead and mark your plus deltas in the questions box as well. Those will be given to LCI as well as the presenters. The next question is, so what is the standardized number of hours worked for each safety correction in the rate calculation? Do you track it for each sub across all projects or just on a project level? Uh, so I, I, I might have to go back and look, but I think the constant is 200,000. Um, it's 400,000 for, but what's it for OSHA? 200. It's 200 for OSHA. Okay, so if it's 200 for, 200 is the standard, is the constant for uh, EMR in the industry for like Cal OSHA. Ours, our measure is slightly less than that. I think it's a, then half of that, 100,000. Um, and it really, though it's important to remember, that it really doesn't matter necessarily um, what that constant is. The constant just puts the rate into, um, you know, usable, um, visible form. Um, as opposed to being a very large number or a very small number, it just it, it, it's just a constant. But um, I, I believe it is 100,000, half of what uh, the um, the Cal or the, the uh, recordable incident rate constant is. Okay. Our next question is: You stated that you are figuring TIR by number of accidents times man hours work divided by a constant. Is that correct, or are you doing it by number of accidents times the constant divided by man hours worked? Uh, I might have misstated that. I think it's. I think it is incidents times a constant divided by man hours work, right? I, I think that's right. Whatever the formula is, the, the formula for, I can look it up real quick, but the formula for recordable incident rate is, is a well-published uh, formula, and I think it's, 
times man hours work divided by the constant, I think. Maybe the other way around. I'll, I'll look it up real quick. But, but regardless, our formula for our rate exactly reflects what the industry standard calculation is. Okay, well while you're looking that up, we do have another question for you. You mentioned you were using a safety incentive program that has to do with no lost times accidents and or no recordables. Has Cal OSHA followed the federal OSHA in citing those types of programs? Can you repeat the question? Sure. You mentioned you are using a safety incentive program that has to do with no lost times accidents and or no recordables. Has Cal OSHA followed the federal OSHA in citing those types of programs? Uh, yes, they have. Cal OSHA always follows in line with federal OSHA. In fact, it's a federal mandate that they have to. So each respective state, whether it's Cal OSHA or, say, Washington OSHA, um, they're all reviewed annually by federal OSHA, and they have to be in compliance with their new programs. Awesome. The next question is, can you track your data based on individual inspector or observer? Uh, we, we, we do both. And um, for, uh, we've, yes, we do track individual observers um, most of the time, I should say. There's some, there's some times when on a project it's, it's uh, better, frankly, that we don't track that. Um, but specifically when when our safety professionals and our management staff do observations, we do always track um, who the observer is. Okay, our next question is, how do you ensure consistency in the data collection? Um, well, that's a, that's a, I'm not sure what exactly that question is getting at, but uh, that is definitely a challenge. Um, we. One thing that I've specifically found is that um, we need to make uh, data collection as simple as possible, especially when we're asking, um, you know, guys in the field who are, who are uh, you know, working, uh, and their, their primary role is not to be doing safety observation. They're actually in the process of executing work. Uh, we want to make sure that the data that we are asking for uh, is is concise and simple for that specific reason so that we can maintain consistency. So when we're asking for uh, a safety professional to do a formal job site inspection and, and uh, walk with a safety report, obviously we're collecting more detailed information, but the information that we collect um, from tradesmen or from more casual observers is, is much more simple uh, and much more uh, concise than, than uh, other folks. Does that make sense? If you need to and that didn't answer your question, please elaborate further and I will make sure and ask uh, the question and your elaboration. So if you'll yeah, do that uh, for me, that would be great. Okay. Hey, I did, I did just get a clarification here on our rate. So, so the, the rate for the industry is the number of incidents times 200,000 times the constant divided by uh, the number of man hours worked. And so our rate on the job, uh, the way we calculate the rate is the number of corrections observed times the constant, which is 100,000, divided by man hours worked for that specific firm on that particular project. Thank you very much. Let's see, we have a comment into a question here. Um, it says, I did this in 2012. It was labor intensive, transferring inspection data to spreadsheets and then to graphs. I presented my findings and it wasn't received all that well, so I quit doing it. I need to get more buy-in and appreciation of the data. Did you face that challenge? Absolutely. Um, we did. Well, uh, maybe some of it. We, de I, we definitely faced the challenge of it being labor intensive. Um, back to uh, what I said before about trying to simplify the data collection when it doesn't need to be more, make it as simple as possible. Obviously, when we have safety professionals um, and people who are in charge of, you know, their primary responsibility on the job is monitoring safety, their inspections need to be more detailed, more robust, more complicated. But collecting data points from other sources um, it, it is important to make sure that we collect 
only the information that we need uh, and not more for that express purpose to make sure that because what we found is if, you, if we ask for too much or too complicated or don't, or don't provide a method for um, simply a simple way for people to provide input, but uh, it just it doesn't happen, and then the data the the data suffers on a job, and the accuracy of the data suffers because there's there's fewer observations that are being completed. Okay, our next question is: Who collects the data that you are using? How do you overcome potential bias in that data if it is collected by a contractor or your own employees? So a, a, a couple of different things: we we collect data from every available source. Um, that, that's the ideal, anyway, on a project. Um, it starts with, like I said, formal daily and monthly safety audits of the project that are done by safety professionals. Uh, we take, we extract information from those reports to input into the system. Um, we collect data from uh, owners and consultants and design professionals that walk the job. Those, those folks are usually um, more than willing to provide documentation of their observations, and it's pretty easy to capture that information. Um, and then we capture observations from other other people on the project, like whether that's um, management staff that's walking the project or uh, trade supervision that are on the project uh, intermittently, as well as tradesmen themselves who are on the job um, constantly doing the work. Um, and so there's different ways that we found to collect information from the different from different people and what makes it easier and for each of those groups might be different from what makes it easier for another. So first of all we extract information from formal reports. We ask we provide different ways for people to input the input information. They can either um, fill out a formal report, fill out a formal uh, we have data input sheets on some jobs that we distribute as people go to walk the job and they handwrite notes and provide those back to the team for input. We also just have ways that people can just walk into the trailer and, and provide the information verbally or scribble stuff on pieces of paper and drop it in a box on the job site. Any of those ways, the, the point is really to get as many points of information as we can. Well, thank you. Uh, our next question is, are subcontractor personnel expected to report incidents that are not in compliance with Excel construction site specific safety program? Or are instances recorded only instances witnessed by Excel personnel? If so, how long has it taken to get subcontractors on board with the program? So it, that's an excellent question. It, it, um, that is that kind of cultural shift that I was talking about when I was going through the slides. And it, it, we, ideally, the expectation is that any observation observed by anybody is, provides information into the data, um, which would mean not just things that are observed by Excel construction, but things that are observed by anyone um, at any point on the job. Um, and it does take time, and it does take training and reinforcement on every project to try and shift that focus or shift the mentality from observations being kind of punitive or punishable offenses to to that being a constructive input and a constructive addition to making the job site safer. Okay, our next question is, can you speak to how Excel construction is organized at the corporate level and geographical office level as it relates to safety? Sure. Uh, so at the corporate level, you've got myself. Um, I'm the head of safety here. I'm located in our corporate office um, in Silicon Valley. Um, we have a regional safety manager in Sacramento. Um, and then we also have a staff of six full-time safety professionals um, that essentially each person is, is uh, assigned a certain geography and they visit their projects within that geography on a weekly basis to assist with safety. Um, and that can be anything from pre-task meetings to JHAs to assisting with crane picks um, and things of that nature. Okay. Do you have an observation rate target per worker per some period of time? Uh, we, we have done that on a couple of projects. Um, 
that's one thing that we um, did experiment with tying incentives to, frankly, on 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 a project where we said, okay, if we get 80 percent, um, well, if we set a target of of getting, let's say, I forget what the exact target was, but getting one observation per person per day on the job, and we achieve 80 percent of that, so we tied some project incentive to that. Um, it, it, that is a, a little bit of a, of a double-edged sword, though, um, in that I think that sometimes created um, uh, people kind of falsely, cre falsely creating observations just to get them done to meet an incentive, um, especially when that target was published and publicly kind of incentivized. Um, from a general standpoint, though, yeah, I, I think 80% of that number is, is the right uh, whether it's published or not, that's the right kind of target rate for observation is 80% of one observation per person per day on the job site. Okay, our next question is, what other confounders exist for your overall improvements? Have there been other intentional initiatives to shift culture, such as performance expectations by role, other lean initiatives, or other organizational focus points? Uh, th there has been. I mean, sa safety in general, the culture in our company, and I think in our in our industry, meaning in our on the projects that we work on with the other the other folks that are involved in there, the culture is is generally very strong. Our our um, culturally, our push is to ensure that um, safety is a company wide incentive and a com and that company wide we're involved in safety on a day to day basis. What I mean specifically by that is that um, we do have safety professionals full-time, like Mike mentioned. On larger projects, we have dedicated safety professionals full-time uh, involved in those projects 40 hours a week throughout the duration of the project. But um, in order to be most effective in implementation of our program, it really requires involvement and almost full-time participation from our company top to bottom. So we, we have um, buy-in and involvement for, for safety from our senior leadership. We have buy-in and participation day to day in our safety programs from uh, superintendents, project managers, and project engineers on projects. Uh, and then our field crews obviously um, participate in safety day to day. That, that I think is kind of culturally what makes the biggest difference is having involvement and participation from all levels of um, both management and field staff as opposed to isolating that function to safety, the safety department or safety professionals um, or even field, field, um, field supervision uh, at the project level. And I'd just like to add that, honestly, weekly we review safety across the company. So it's, it's something that's kept at the forefront of everybody's mind from top down. Um, and has really created that strong safety culture that Excel has. That I think is really what drives uh, is a, really is what driving the statistics that we've been able to achieve. And if I could just tag onto that really quickly, um, I also think, and I mentioned this earlier during the webinar uh, presentation portion, that everybody at Excel, and I really mean everybody, is wholeheartedly bought into the idea and the belief that the most important thing we do every day is truly is safety and it's really all about sending our, our workers home and our subcontractors and clients um, home to their families every night. If we can't do that then there's nothing else that is as important to us or as valuable to us as being able to achieve that and everybody really buys that. That's, that's really our mantra here. Okay, we are running out of time, so I want to get to as many questions as I possibly can. I will tell you that anything that's in the questions box will get sent to everybody at Excel Construction, so they will be able to get back with you after the webinar. So let's go ahead and say, can you share any specific programs or changes that you have made as a result of tracking leading issues? Um. Well, I mean, I think at, at a project level specifically, the, um, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but specifically what we, what I can think of 
most notably that we've adjusted based on it is the safety is the specific trainings on projects uh, that we provide based on observed information. So, um, like I mentioned before, not just having kind of generic or arbitrary topics for um, for training. I can think of an example where we were moving from um, you know shell and core construction into overhead rough-in on a project, and we're really having a problem with um, uh, lift use and safe, you know, fall protection and use of lifts um, as people started to transition from from working on the decks to working overhead off the decks, um, and through the observation of, you know, a spike in people's behavior, unsafe behavior, working in scissor lifts, um, we're able to bring in specific training for the job on on use of scissor lifts use of fall protection within scissor lifts, safe operation, et cetera, et cetera. A direct target, targeted training to, to the project staff uh, for something specifically observed, uh, and we're able to reduce the number of um, unsafe behaviors during that phase of that project uh, specifically for that. I think that's what the question was asking. Um, but that's where I see the most tangible and most relevant um, um, modifications to our program that we make based on the information is those really targeted and specific trainings uh, that address actual observations uh, of behavior on a project. Okay, this is going to be our last question for the webinar, but I'm going to urge you if you do have any more questions for Jason, Kevin, or Mike, please go ahead and type them into the questions box because they will be receiving them and we'll be able to get back with you. So the last question I have is, what is your process for un onboarding new trade partners? Um, so we have quite a robust orientation process um, that varies whether that's an Excel employee or a subcontractor, and I believe you're asking about subcontractors. Um, we have what we call our subcontractor safety program, uh, which is essentially a web-based program that we asked all of our trade partners, or should I say require all of our trade partners to participate in prior to coming to a project. Um, essentially, it is an orientation online that goes through all of Excel's expectations of them, sort of from a corporate level um, as well as at a project level. They then show up to the project with a certificate that they've printed out proving that they've been through the program. Um, once they arrive to the project, they are then ran through a, a very robust site-specific safety plan, which really identifies all those specific hazards relevant to that project. Um, as you know, each project is different. Um, this is really a living document that changes as the project changes, um, and so we run people back through things as things change, uh, but in a nutshell, that's sort of our orientation process. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Excel Construction for participating in our webinar today. I'd also like to thank you guys for listening in and for asking so many wonderful questions. Um, Again, you still have another couple of seconds to ask any questions that you'd like. They will be given to Excel Construction as well as LCI and any plus deltas that you have. So thank you very much again. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. And this recording will be available on our website at the end of next week.